says there is it says uh, how these papers have been placed in sequence will be made manifest in the reading of them. All needless matters have been eliminated, so that a history almost at variance with the possibilities of latter-day belief may stand forth as simple fact. I love that simple fact. What the hell is that? So there is, there is throughout no statement of past things wherein memory may err, for all the records chosen are exactly contemporary, given from the standpoints and within the range of knowledge of those who made them. So, like, what the hell? What's going on here? So, first off, like, the thing that sort of strikes me right off the bat is that it seems to me that this little note is informing you that you are in a world that is producing a super huge amount of discourse, right? Like, what we have in this novel is only a small selection of all the stuff that's being written by these characters, right? All needless matters have been eliminated. So these people are taking diary entries about their interactions with Dracula, about their interactions with each other, about the vampire hunt, about their travels to Transylvania, but also, presumably, they're producing diary entries about all kinds of other stuff as well. Like, we are in a diary-producing, write-about-everything world. And so that's like seems to be the first thing that this little note is telling you. But then also the note is telling you that the sequence of information that you're going to get in this novel has been arranged by a professional hand. Like, in order for facts, in order for simple fact to stand out, you can't just have sort of an information vomit. Like, if you imagine sort of the online dating sorting algorithms, like, if what you got whenever you went on an online dating site was just every word that every single person who ever logged onto the site ever wrote on the site, it would be impossible to sort through. It would be totally useless. You could produce a whole bunch of discourse, and it would do nothing for you. In order for discourse to work, it has to be arranged by a professional, no less, right? A kind of disembodied intelligence that's here for us now. If you want to try to find the grammatical agents in these sentences, mm. you will be looking for a long time. These papers have been placed. <laughs> no, Needless no. matters have been eliminated. Mm. Records have been chosen. <laughs> so in other words, the passive voice suggests a kind of uh -huh. disembodied intelligence that creates order out of a teeming mass of information. Right, right. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. And, and it's important to know that, um, that, the, that what we have here, too, is a kind of set of translations. Mm -hmm. um, and we talked about the idea that well, the different forms in which the novel mm -hmm. takes, right? I, I have them listed here, but it's journal letters, mm -hmm. phonographic diary. Do they know what a phonograph is? Do you guys know what a phonograph is? You can't talk back, but <laughs> um, if, what is a phonograph? It's really similar to what we're doing here, just without pictures. So it's basically like a wax tube that like you speak into a little machine and it records your voice by making like etchings on a wax tube and then the wax tube like sort of codes your words so that then it can be sort of decoded again. I guess it's basically like a little memo taking machine. But but carved physically into wax cylinders mm -hmm. um, and, and we'll talk about those next time. It's fascinating. Phonograph, writing sound, right? Mm -hmm. And then also telegram. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and those those different forms are translated into shorthand mm -hmm. um, and then translated back and, and we have a little sample yeah. of shorthand. Do you want to show them that? Yeah, so like at various points in the novel, Jonathan Harker talks about how he's like writing in shorthand because like so it kind of looks like this if you can see. Yeah, just hold that up for a second. Yeah, it kind of looks like just a bunch of squibbly goggly gook but the point of shorthand, like why would anyone ever need shorthand? The idea of shorthand is that, like, you can write it really quickly. Instead of, like, writing down every word someone says, like, he said H-E space S-A-I-D, etc., 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 instead you just have these sort of squiggles and this sort of code that allows you to write super fast so that you don't miss anything. 
You have like, total, you have total, but it also is translating it. And as we saw with Sosur, every time you translate it, there's a step of mediation there. And in, in a way, you could consider Dracula to be kind of about these steps of mm -hmm. transmission or yeah, mediation. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. If you look at page 61 on, in our version, um, we, we have the transformation of an epistolary novel, which is a form we know, to takes the form of letters back and forth, mm -hmm. right? Into this new thing, which is like, you might call it a media novel, mm -hmm. uh, a, a novel of the media age. Yeah. On 61, at the end of chapter 5, Dr. Seward's diary, and then in parentheses it says, kept in phonograph, mm -hmm. right? Then if you sw switch the page, we shift back out of these oral, this oral case study in the Freudian manner, maybe mm -hmm. we can talk about that, yeah. to the letter from Quincy Morris to the Honorable Holmwood, right? Mm -hmm. Then we shift, and that has its own genre conventions, My Dear Art, and then it mm -hmm. starts, Yours as Ever, and then we switch again, yet again, Telegram from Holmwood mm -hmm. to Morris, and this ha too has its own conventions right, right, right. and structuring capacities. Did you want to say anything? Like, yeah, that? well, I mean, just look at the difference between yours, as ever, and always, Quincy P. Morris. So, like, formal, florid, but then just compare it to the Telegraph sign-off, art, period. Right? So, the part of what the novel seems to be trying to communicate trying to communicate here is that there's sort of like the older form of a letter that has its own particular ways of speaking versus sort of the new telegraph economy where like it costs money to send every single word through a telegraph and that starts to affect the kinds of things that you can say. Yeah. Mm. Stefan, yeah. did you want to talk, we have about seven minutes left and I wanted mm. to see, do you want to talk about um, my our favorite, I mean, did we agree before it's our favorite character, Mr. Renfield? Yeah. Do you want to talk, yeah, no, let's, tell us let's, how to understand Renfield? So let's talk a little bit about Renfield, right? Like, so the first thing is, is he's not like a major character in the novel, but he is because he himself, like there's a lot of discourse that gets produced in this novel, but Renfield, we never get any letters. We never get any like notes written by Renfield himself. He only speaks in as much as he's being transcribed by other people. And so let's just take a look at what it looks like whenever these sort of professional, um, the professional Dr. Seward is trying to take Renfield, who's this strange, crazy character who makes arguably as little sense as Dracula makes, and tries to make sense of him. Take someone who's abnormal, who's strange, and tries to sort of understand him at, like a case study, very similar to what Freud does as well, right? Like, take a person and try and make them into a case. So we're looking at, what page are we looking at it's, now? It's, I think it's my page 71. It's chapter 6. Uh -huh. Are we looking at the 11 p.m. Yeah, let's look at entry. the 11 p.m. That's on entry. 71 of our, our, our version. Yeah, so there, here we have Dr. Seward, who's just been keeping track of Renfield as he always does. And we have 11 p.m. Note here that we're, like, getting the time of day whenever this is being recorded. Like, that's important, right? Regimented, professionalized, mm -hmm. I'm late, I'm late, I'm late. Yeah. The, bureauc the bourgeois time of the clock. Yeah, right. I mean, like, you, you can't just say, you, if you're going to keep track of someone, you need to keep track of someone with reference to an authoritative temporal index. So, 11 p.m. I gave Renfield a strong opiate tonight. Did, did, did Renfield consent to this? I don't know. I don't even think it matters, does it? So I gave Renfield a strong opiate tonight, enough to make him, enough to make him, enough to make even him sleep, and took away his pocketbook to look at it. The thought that has been buzzing around my brain lately is complete, and the theory proved. My homicidal mania. Do you have a homicidal maniac? Your, your very own one? My homicidal maniac is of, a peculiar, uh, is of a peculiar kind. I shall have to invent a new classification for him and call him a zoophagus? Zoophagus? Yeah. I think a zoophagus parenthesis life eating maniac. What he desires is to absorb as many lives as he can, and he has laid himself out to achieve it in a cumulative way. He gave many flies to one spider and many spiders to one bird, and then wanted a cat to eat the many birds. 
what would have been his later steps? It would almost be worthwhile to complete the experiment. It might be done if there were only a sufficient cause. Men sneered at vivisection, so vivisection is like the cutting open of animals and people for experimental purposes. Men sneered at vivisection, and yet look at the results today. Why not advance science in its most difficult and vital aspect, the knowledge of the brain? Had I even the secret of one such mind? Did I hold the key to the fancy of even one lunatic? I might advance my own branch of science to a pitch compared with which Burden Sanderson's physiology or Farrier's brain knowledge would be nothing. I love brain knowledge. Brain knowledge. Like neuroscience, right? Like <laughs> that, that word may one day come to sound just as silly as brain knowledge does to us now. Um, would be as nothing. If only there were a sufficient cause, I must not think too much of this, or I may be tempted. A good cause might turn the scale with me, for may I not be too, for may not I too be of an exceptional brain, congenitally. Alright, so wow, right? So, one thing that, um, that we didn't talk about when we were just chatting about this before is that hmm is the taking away the pocketbook to look at it. Right. So what do you make of that? I mean, so he says, I, t I gave him an opiate, I took away his pocketbook to look at it, and then there's an end of a sentence, mm. and then the new sentence starts, the thought that has been buzzing around my brain lately is complete. In other words, he gives his diagnosis. Mm -hmm. So what did we miss there? The reading of the pocketbook. Yeah. The translation of Renfield's mm -hmm. discourse into, into this other discourse. Right, right, right. So what right. do we make of that? Yeah, so like here, you, you, what you kind of see is that simultaneously with the 11 o'clock p.m., this is purporting to be an official discourse that gives you absolutely everything. But then also, the novel is allowing you to see that there's sort of this gathering of knowledge and then a period that we could almost read as an ellipsis. Right? Like, what we're missing here is he takes the pocketbook and then he spends some time reading it. Maybe he goes to reference some other psychological studies. And then he comes back with the thought that has been buzzing around my brain lately is complete. The theory proved. And so whenever you guys are, like, reading through this novel, it's interesting to know how it, like, tempts you into thinking that, like, one sentence follows from the next, follows from the next, follows from the next. But there's always, as we got in the very first... Um, note to the novel, there's always all this sort of quote-unquote useless material that's being pulled out of it, right? Yeah, and then, and so then it, and it's translating the language of Renfield into the language of, what would you call it? A professional Like a professional discourse, right? A professional discourse. So, and that happens, mm -hmm. and he, he struggles to, to figure out what Renfield is. So yeah, can yeah, show yeah. us that part? So yeah, and so here we're, we're looking, so look at look at what he does here. He says, first off he starts with my homicidal maniac. So homicidal maniac is apparently like a term that's just floating around out there. But Seward, as a good professional, is thinking not only how he can repeat the things that everyone else is already saying, but how can he advance them further. So he has my homicidal maniac, and then is of a peculiar kind. I, as a discourse professional, as a professional, will have to invent a new classification for him and call him a zoophagous, life-eating maniac. So he's not just homicidal. Like, that would almost be too boring. That, that just tells you, like, what he might do eventually. If you go on our version to the previous page on 19 July at the bottom, right before the 10 p.m. thing, he says, the man is an undeveloped homicidal maniac. So mm -hmm. he gives that diagnosis before, but you can see exactly what mm -hmm. Seth is saying. He's improving on it. He's trying to fine-tune it. Mm -hmm. He's getting a better drop-down menu uh, of, of, of what he is. Yeah. Right. And it's also like, it's not only what he might do at some future point, he's homicidal, he might kill someone, but rather, like, how does he actually work in and of himself? Like, what does he eat? What does he do? Who is he? It's not enough just to know that he might kill someone. We actually have to know his whole case history. We have to steal his little pocketbook and see what he's writing down. We have to collect as much information about who he is in order to fully understand him. And the, and the, and the motivation 
Seward sort of gives the motivation 